Welcome to the Rowing Canada Aviron Safety Video. This video has been produced by RCA with the assistance of many groups, including the Victoria City and Gorge Rowing Clubs, their members, RCA volunteers and staff, and Canadian equipment suppliers. RCA has issued safety guidelines which provide guidance to clubs on establishing procedures to provide a safe rowing environment for their members. This video is in concert with those guidelines and is designed to educate rowers, particularly those just starting out how to row, using these safety procedures. Safety is everyone's business. Staying safe depends on many factors. The safety procedures presented in this video may not apply in every situation. Rowers and coaches must take personal responsibility for being aware of any risks, identifying hazardous situations, and practicing the safety procedures employed by their club. The video has been shot presenting multiple angles and slow-mo illustrations of how to row more safely. We trust that you will enjoy your rowing experience more by employing these safety procedures. Remember that the personal safety of each rower is of paramount importance. Concern for equipment or the desire to put in training time on the water must always be secondary to the safety of the rowers. We have divided this video into five chapters. Chapter 1, at the boathouse. 2, getting ready to row. 3, on the water. 4, returning to the dock. And chapter 5, coaching guidelines. The last chapter provides guidance specifically for coaches concerning safety issues. Chapter 1. At the Boathouse Those who have not yet been in a rowing shell might assume that your experience will begin when you get into the boat. That will be the start of your workout, but there are a number of things to do before you launch from the dock. You'll need to know how to get the boat from the boathouse and into the water. And most importantly, prior to leaving the dock, each rower should be familiar with their local water rules and understand the emergency procedures. This information should be posted on notice boards in the boathouse. They should include local water rules. Each club should have a map or a diagram that shows the traffic pattern for their waterway. It's essential that all rowers, especially the coxswain or the bow person, clearly understands and abides by the local water traffic patterns, the right of way, and sharing the use of the water with other marine traffic. Emergency Action Plan Each club's emergency action plan should be posted in a prominent location on an information board. The EAP should include the club's address and phone number and list the names of emergency organizations, all with their appropriate phone numbers. The Rowers Out In Logbook This logbook records what boats are on the water, who is in them, and when they are expected to return. It is an important safety tracking tool to ensure that all those crews who have launched have in fact returned at or around the expected time. It is particularly important for single scholars or unsupervised crews. This out-in book also keeps crews to a schedule if they are sharing the same equipment. Equipment Repairs This board provides information about which shells, oars or coach boats are out of commission or in need of repair. Upon returning from a row, the sculler or crew should report any damage which requires repair before that equipment is taken out again. Transport Canada Regulations You should be aware that all vessels using Canadian waters are governed by the Canada Shipping Act, which sets out regulations for the operation of small vessels. These will be enforced by police forces, conservation officers, and other authorized agencies. These regulations specify the safety equipment that must be carried in the coach boat and in rowing shells. Safety equipment to be carried in the coach boat. An approved personal flotation device for all occupants of the coach boat and each person in the largest shell under their care. A buoyant heaving line. A paddle. A sound signaling device. A bailer. Watertight flashlight or flares. And navigation lights if operated before sunrise. This list can be found in Transport Canada's Safe Boating Guide or on the web. RCA further recommends thermal blankets and a boatside ladder. Safety equipment to be carried in the rowing shells. A personal flotation device for each person when not accompanied by a coach boat. A whistle and a flashlight. RCA Safety Guidelines The RCA Safety Guidelines are found in printed format and are downloadable from the RCA website. RCA Weather Protocol 
RCA has established a weather protocol to assist coaches and rowers. Check the Environment Canada website for your local forecast. Using the Environment Canada time-lapse radar and satellite imagery, the coach or rower can see the existing conditions and predict the arrival and duration of impending short-term weather systems. Some clubs might have their own actual weather station, which can display a synopsis of the immediate relevant data for local conditions. When you get to the club, if you observe strong winds, white caps, hear thunder, see lightning, or fog is present, you should probably not go on the water. If you're on the water and these conditions arise, you should return to the boathouse or get to the nearest safe haven. Personal Flotation Devices There are many different models of personal flotation devices available for use by both rowers and coaches. Mustang Survival has a great range of products for all shapes, sizes, and on-water functions. It's important to know how to properly use whichever style you have in the rowing shell or in the coach boat. Note that the Transport Canada regulations stipulate that individuals under 16 years of age or under 36.3 kilograms may not use any inflatable PFDs. For rowers and coaches, the following PFDs offer flotation to suit specific needs and are Transport Canada approved. Red Cross Adult Boater's Vest, Inflatable Collar PFD, Standard Vest or Inflatable Belt Pack. It's a good practice to periodically check the flotation worthiness of your own or the club's PFDs by testing them in shallow water or in a pool. It is also important to make sure that PFDs are stored properly, both between rows and at the end of the day. If the PFDs have been used, make sure the bag or container is opened and the contents are allowed to dry. By keeping all this equipment dry and in good operating order, we can make sure that the safety equipment will be ready to be used when needed. Also check that any items such as space blankets or inflatable CO2 cartridges are replaced if they've been used. Preventing Melanoma The risk of skin cancer today is much greater than it was 20 years ago. The principal known cause of skin cancer is prolonged exposure to the sun's ultraviolet rays over many years. The most harmful effects of sun exposure occur before the age of 25. The sooner you protect yourself, the better. The Canadian Cancer Society advises people to practice regular skin examinations and report any changes as soon as possible to their doctor. We need to be proactive in preventing melanoma and watch for symptoms. One of the most important ways to prevent melanoma when rowing is to apply sunscreen before going on the water. Wearing proper clothing, wear a hat, and sunglasses. Hypothermia. One of the risks of being on the water, particularly in cold weather or cold water conditions, is hypothermia. Hypothermia is a condition created when the temperature of the body drops below 35 degrees Celsius. While mild hypothermia can be reversed, serious hypothermia can result in death. How to prevent hypothermia. Wind, rain, and cold temperatures can all contribute to hypothermia. Therefore, dress appropriately for cold weather, including wearing a hat. You can recognize mild hypothermia when someone is shivering. The person may not be able to perform fine motor functions, but can still walk and talk. Moderate hypothermia can be recognized when a person is in a dazed, semi-conscious state. They exhibit loss of fine motor coordination, particularly in the hands. For example, they can't zip up a windbreaker or do up an oarlock. They'll exhibit slurred speech and uncontrollable shivering. With severe hypothermia, the core temperature is very low, which is immediately life-threatening. Shivering occurs in violent waves, then pauses. This may occur if the individual has been exposed in cold water for an extended period of time. Call 911 immediately. Initial management should include CPR if the victim is not breathing or has no pulse. Immersion in water. If you find yourself in the water, get on top of the rowing shell with as much of your core body out of the water as possible. Adopt the help position if you're by yourself, or the huddle position in a group to reduce exposure of the body core to the cold water. Once the person is in a safety boat, reduce heat loss by covering them with a thermal blanket and protect them from the wind or rain. Further core heat loss should be prevented by removing wet garments and insulating the victim with dry clothing or blankets, or by others placing their warm bodies against the victim. Avoid giving the person any alcohol or caffeine. Hyperthermia 
Hyperthermia is the overheating of the body, usually caused by high outside temperatures. Prolonged, vigorous exercise in warm, humid weather is the major cause of hyperthermia. In order to prevent hyperthermia, stay well hydrated before, during, and after rowing. Avoid drinks containing more than 2.5% sugar, drinks with alcohol, and drinks with caffeine. Avoid salt tablets or sports drinks with high sodium concentrations. If temperature and humidity are going to be extremely high, row early in the day or later in the evening. When not on the water, stay in the shade. Heat cramping is expressed by extreme sweating in the large working muscles. Massage can provide immediate relief of the cramps. Heat exhaustion is expressed with cramps, tiredness, decrease in performance, impaired judgment, and emotional changes. Confusion, vomiting, and seizures may follow. If you suspect an athlete is suffering from heat exhaustion, have them rest and encourage fluid replenishment. Heat stroke displays dry or clammy skin, and in extreme cases, the rower may lose consciousness. Get medical help immediately. Lower the victim's body into cool water, maintaining a horizontal position. Stop treatment when the victim is conscious and alert. Rowing at dawn and dusk. There are far greater risks rowing in the dark before sunrise and after sunset. If a shell capsizes, it'll be extremely difficult to attract attention and effect a rescue. As a general guideline, it's recommended that rowers should not launch any earlier than one half hour before official sunrise. We also recommend that all boats should return to the dock no later than official sunset. This allows only 30 minutes of diminishing light until it's too dark to effectively see on the water. More time may be needed to find crews a long way away on a river, a large lake, or ocean bay. What also needs to be taken into account is the specific local body of water that you row on. Chapter 2. Getting Ready to Row As mentioned in Chapter 1, a vital step in the prevention of hypo and hyperthermia is dressing appropriately for the conditions. The following are the recommended practices for athletes to dress in cold or hot weather. Rowers Hot Weather Attire Wear a long or short sleeve t-shirt for protection from the sun. Lightweight long shorts. Wear a peak cap or a marine hat, ideally with cover for your ears and the back of your neck. Liberally apply a sunscreen with a high SPF factor, particularly when on the water between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. when the UV rays are the strongest. Sunglasses will cut down on the direct rays from the sun and the glare indirectly off the water. For those rowing a single, don't forget to take your PFD to the boat with you. Rowers cold weather attire. The key to keeping warm on those rows in cold conditions is to properly layer your clothing. The layer closest to your skin should be made of a wicking fiber to take sweat away from your skin and transport to the next layer of your clothing. The second mid layer should be made of a warm material such as a fleece or wool. The top outside layer should be a windbreaker. Completing the attire should include wool socks, toque, and pogies. These are essential to stop rapid heat loss from your feet, head, and hands. Sunglasses will cut down on the glare from the sun, protecting your eyes. For those going out in a single without a coach or safety boat, a PFD is required. For those rowing in larger boats without an accompanying coach boat, make sure that you have your PFDs with you in the boat, under your seat or footboards. When a coach boat accompanies more than one crew, there should be enough PFDs for everyone in the coach boat and all rowers in the largest shell under that coach's supervision. For example, a coach with an 8 and two fours must have a minimum of 9 PFDs for the rowers. A whistle should be carried by one person in the boat either the coxswain or the bow person in the crew boat, while the single scholar should always have one with them. Warm up on land. A warm up can be subdivided into two parts, a general warm up and a specific warm up. In rowing, the general warm up will take place on land just before taking the boat to the water. This general warm up should raise the body temperature until there's a light sweat. The aim is to allow for progressive muscle stretching after the body temperature has increased slightly. Rowers should not warm up and then stand around waiting to lift the boat off the racks. 
As the body temperature drops, the elasticity of the muscle fibers decrease, thereby risking an injury. Specific rowing warm-ups will take place on the water in the boat. Rowing commands. The commands for moving boats on dry land are designed to coordinate the actions of the crew to avoid injury and to prevent damaging the equipment. Injuries occur and boats are easily damaged when moving shells from their racks, so the crew must concentrate on the task at hand, be alert to the commands, and move in unison to avoid these risks. There is a rowing vocabulary that may be foreign to you at first, but don't worry. Over the course of your initial rowing sessions, these terms will become familiar to you. These commands, usually given by your coach, coxswain, or the bow person, may vary slightly from club to club, but will include the following terminology. Hands on the boat. The crew will spread the length of the cockpit with hands on the gunnels, ready to lift and take the weight. Take the weight, ready up. All hands lift the boat off the racks. Walk it out. The crew walks the shell sideways, clear of the riggers, out to the middle of the boat bay. Split from the bow to the port or starboard side as crew members go under the boat alternately to take the weight of the boat overhead and down to the shoulders. Walk it out. The crew walks the boat out of the house in the middle of the boat bay, watching the riggers of their shell and the riggers of the other boats on the racks on either side. Shell on the tarmac. The crew brings the boat out of the boathouse onto the tarmac and onto the stretchers. Let it run. This is perhaps the most important command and one you should remember from your very first outing. Let it run means stop. Stop doing whatever you're doing on land or on the water. Over the heads, ready up. The crew lifts the boat overhead and align themselves under the center of the boat. Inside grips. The crew gets a grip with handholds on the inner parts of the shell or the gunnels. Roll it away from the stretchers. With all rowers on one side of the hull, the crew rolls the boat down to arm's length. Walk it back. The crew walks the boat backwards between the stretchers. Ease it down. The crew lowers the boat onto the stretchers, in this example, right side up to check the interior of the shell. This is the time the crew makes adjustments to their individual positions. Checking the condition of a shell. It is a good practice to check the boat you're about to row before you launch each outing. Key points to check on the boat's exterior before each row are, feel for checks or cracks on the skin of the hull. Check that the bow and stern compartment vents are closed and make sure the bow ball is firmly attached. The fin. Make sure it is firmly affixed and straight with the spine of the hull. After you have checked the exterior of the shell, it is now time to check the inside of the boat with each rower checking their own seat. Each rower should check the condition of the heel tie downs to make sure they are secure and allow the heels to rise no more than 7 cm or the width of the knuckles of a fist. This is a very important safety feature as these tethers will stop the heel of the shoe and allow you to pull your feet out if the boat capsizes. Rowers and or the coach should do a quick check to see that the riggers are securely attached to the hull and the top nut on the oarlock pin is tight. All rowers should check the sliding seat wheels and the wheel tracks to make sure they're rolling smoothly. Getting the boat to the water. Getting a boat to the water requires all crew members to be listening to the commands given by the coach, coxswain, or the bow and reacting in unison. This coordination of effort will share the weight of the shell equally among the crew and make the load lighter for each individual. Walk it down. The crew walks the boat down the ramp, being aware of potential hazards on the ramp. Let her run. The crew stops walking and waits for the next command. Standing on the side of the dock, they will launch the boat. Over the heads, ready, up. The crew lifts the shell from their shoulders to overhead as they step under the center of the boat. Inside grips, the crew grabs holding points on the shell's interior. 
Toes to the edge. The crew carefully places their feet on the edge of the dock. Roll it towards the water. The crew rolls the boat from overhead towards the water. Reach out and set it down. The crew reaches out with the hull in unison and away from their bodies to gently lower the shell onto the water, carefully keeping the hull away from the edge of the dock. Getting into a crew boat. Getting into the boat can be tricky for the first couple of times. There are a few tips that will ensure it's an easier and safer experience. The first thing to remember is that the dockside oars are the first oars that should be put into the oar locks. By putting these in first, you'll be creating an on-dock balance point for the boat, thereby allowing the waterside rowers a more stable platform so they can reach out and over the boat to put their oars in the oar locks. As you're reaching over to put your oars in the oar lock, keep low and place your body weight in the middle of the boat as much as possible. This will keep the center of gravity in the most stable position. After all oars are in the oar locks with the gates firmly closed, the bow person or coxswain will call the crew to enter the boat. As the crew enters the shell, they place their water side foot on a bracing in the boat and with one hand on their oar handle and the other on the dock or a gunnel, they carefully place the other foot into the boat. Making sure that the shell's sliding seat is behind them and with one hand on the oar handle, they place the other foot into the shoe and lower themselves into the seat of the shell. Getting the single to the water. Launching a single will be a bit more challenging for the inexperienced rower. Getting the single down to the water safely can be done in a number of ways. The easiest for beginners is with the assistance of another person. This method reduces the chance of injuries or equipment breakage. Be sure to lower the weight of the shell with your legs, not your back. For more experienced single scholars, getting their boat to the water can be accomplished by carrying the boat to the water overhead or by slinging the shell under your arms. Carrying the shell overhead using just arms or balanced partly on the head requires strength and excellent balance. This method is for seasoned scholars only. Getting into a single. The first step is to put the dockside skull into the oarlock and secure the gate. This will help counterbalance your weight as you reach out to put your waterside skull in the oar lock. Once both skulls are securely in place, grip both oar handles firmly in one hand and place your waterside foot on a bracing in the boat. With the other hand on the dock or the gunnel, making sure that the boat sliding seat is behind you, carefully place the other foot into the appropriate shoe and lower yourself slowly into the shell onto the boat's sliding seat. Assisted Crew Boat Launch There are several methods of getting a crew boat away from the dock. They are used in different situations depending on the experience of a crew or how busy the docks are. The easiest method for an inexperienced crew is for the coach or another person on the dock to assist by pushing the boat away. They do this by pushing on the end of an oar at right angles to the boat. Keeping the blade low over the dock to avoid tipping the boat, the rower in that seat pushes against the oar to create the resistance. The boat is pushed out to the point where the blades are clear of the dock. Crew seated hand push off. With the entire crew seated in the boat for an unassisted push off, the bow person or coxswain will call hands on the dock. All dockside hands will be placed on the dock with the waterside oars placed flat on the water. Bow or coxswain calls for the crew to lean the boat out to waterside and prepare to push away from the dock. On the command, ready, push, all crew members push the shell away from the dock together. Regardless of the method of launching, it's very important for the single sculler, coxswain or bow to be aware of other boats in the vicinity as they move clear of the dock area. The coach boat, ready to go. Now that the crew is in the boat and ready to go, it is important to make sure that the coach and coach boat are ready as well. As soon as the coach confirms he or she is ready to go, the crew is given the okay to push off and leave the dock area. Practice is about to begin. Chapter three, on the water. Sharing the waterway. There will be some dangerous rowing conditions that vary from rowing course to course. These can include bridges, rocks and channel markers, and other boats and obstructions. While the principle of steam giving way to sail is relevant for all marine traffic, 
When rowing shells share the water with sailing and powered boats, we need to be proactive and take proper precautions. Sailboats may not be able to see a shell blocked by their sail, and a paddler may not see a rowing shell coming up from behind. Check for other traffic and hazards constantly. It's important that all rowers be aware of the potential dangers on the water and respect the right of way. Warm up exercises. This is the first stage of the on water workout. It is important for the crew to perform a warm up activity that will prepare them for the actual workout. For example, if it's a long, low, steady state row, the warm up should approximate that exercise. After about 20 strokes, it is good practice to stop and check the footboards, the oarlocks, and tuck in any clothing. 20 strokes will give each oar the chance to identify any noticeable problems and make those adjustments before the main part of the practice begins. The warm-up activity should gradually build the heart rate up to 120 to 140 beats per minute. Don't get into high ratings or heart pressure until you are fully warmed up. The warm-up should last 8 to 15 minutes before the hard work starts. How to take a large wake. In many cases when rowing, there will be situations where crews will be sharing the waterway with other boats. Large wakes can be created by power boat traffic. When a large wake is seen, a crew should try to maneuver the boat so as to place the shell parallel with the oncoming wave. This will lessen the chance of getting the cockpit swamped or the hull breaking up. Once the crew has positioned the shell parallel to the wake, they should stop rowing and place all blades flat on the water and tilt the boat slightly away from the oncoming wave to lift that side of the hull a little higher. The boat will ride up with the wave and water entering the shell will be minimized. Catching and recovering from a crab. It is not uncommon for novice rowers to catch a crab. This happens when the blade is caught underwater at the finish of the drive phase of the stroke. The hands and oar handle end up too high on the chest. In order to recover from a small crab, the rower should push the hands down to get the blade and shaft out of the water. Then, pushing the oar handle away, pick up the timing from the person in front of them. Catching a large, over-the-head crab. As the name implies, this is when the blade is caught so deep that the oar handle travels right up and over the rower's head. This can happen if a rower is unable to keep up with the rate and their blade gets caught underwater at the release as the boat continues past the stuck oar blade. The oar handle passes over the rower's head with the oar becoming almost parallel with the hull. In most cases, the rest of the crew has to stop rowing as the boat cannot continue until that rower has recovered from the crab. Once stopped, the crew leans out to the opposite side. The rower who caught the crab must move the oar handle from behind them over their head as they lay back over the feet of the person behind them. The person in the seat behind can assist in this corrective process. Once the handle is in front of their body, they sit up and move the oar handle away past their knees, ready to begin rowing again. Boat Swamping when a boat has taken on some water, the result of a wake or rough water conditions, it may be possible to bail the water from the boat and continue rowing. The crew is stopped and prepared for the coach boat to approach them. The coach's boat approaches slowly and under control. The coach places their boat between the oars and riggers on the leeward side of the shell where possible. The coach can hand a bailer to the crew or take an injured rower out of the shell. If the rowing shell is damaged or if someone is injured and unable to be taken out of the shell, the coach has the option of throwing a tow line to the crew to pull the crew to the coach boat or tow the shell to a safe haven. Recovery from capsized or swamp shells. This could happen to you, so it's important to know how to react if your boat capsizes or is swamped. It's important to remember that hypothermia can occur quickly in cold water conditions. You could lose the ability to swim in minutes and become incapable of assisting yourself to get into a rescue boat. It's therefore a critical safety principle to stay with your boat. Do not attempt to swim ashore. The boat can provide flotation and a means of getting partially out of the water to reduce the risk of drowning. Flipped single. If you're in a single and it flips, The first thing to do is get your feet out of the boat.
Then get your PFD out of the shell, put it on, inflate it. and tie it securely on. Writing the single. In this example, you will see how the rower is able to write the single and get back into the boat. As he uses his foot to kick down on the underwater rigger, at the same time, he pulls the above water rigger toward himself, turning the boat upright. He then positions the skull, grabbing hold of the two handles in order to stabilize the boat. Holding both oar handles, he kicks his legs so that he drives his body up and out of the water over the gunwale, placing his seat back onto the boat. Practice this recovery in the pool or shallow water. Using a shell as flotation. After a limited number of attempts, if you're unable to write the single, your best option is to use the boat as a flotation device. Get yourself out of the water and drape over your boat, getting as much of your body out of the water as you can. If you're close to a shore, you can unship the oars, get up on the shell with your body parallel with the hull, and swim the boat like a paddleboard to the shore. Try to attract the attention of the coach boat, your buddy, or other crews near you by using the whistle. If there are other shells nearby with rowers who are able to assist you, get to their boat. Drape yourself over the stern of their boat and have them row you to safety. Swamped or capsized four. When a crew boat has been swamped, the crew member should exit the swamp boat in a calm and controlled manner, as we see here. It is important to get out of the boat because the extra weight of the water, especially in a bow cox boat, can be enough to cause a boat to sink or break up. Getting out sequentially, one at a time, or by pairs affords the most control. If the boat capsizes, the first step once in the water is to get your PFD out of the boat and put it securely on. The best thing to do with a capsize 4 or 8 is to drape over the shell in pairs or in a group of three with the cocks. Linking hands, try to get as much of your body core out of the water as possible. Do not remove clothing, as this can provide some insulation. Don't count on non-wood oars or skulls as flotation, as they can fill with water and sink. Use the whistle to attract attention to your location. If the boat breaks up or otherwise does not provide enough flotation, adopt the help position. Or when in a group, adopt the huddle position to reduce heat loss of the body core to the cold water. Assisting crews in the water. In the case of a crew tipping or swamping without PFDs in their boat, the coach will have to distribute PFDs to each member of the crew in the water as soon as possible. As soon as all members of the crew are safely in their PFDs, the next step is for the coach to help get the rowers out of the water and into the safety boat. In the case of a soft-sided boat, the coach and rowers on board can assist the others by pulling them over the side of their boat. If the coach is driving a hard-sided coach boat, the coach should position themselves within the boat to provide counterbalance for the rowers as they climb into the front, back or side of the coach boat. Boats equipped with a boat ladder provide the best access for getting those who have to be assisted into the coach boat. 
Those who have been helped into the boat should assist the others, remembering that they must balance the boat in order to prevent the rescue boat from tipping over. As soon as the coach has the rowers safely out of the water and into the boat, the rowers should be wrapped in a thermal blanket. If it's a group of rowers, they should huddle together to share body heat and stay down in the boat out of the wind. Cool down on water. The last phase of the rowing workout is the cool down. The purpose of the cool down is to initiate the recovery of the heart rate and return the body temperature to normal. This phase also allows the crew to focus on good technique and then print some of the drills they were working on during that practice. The coach should initiate low intensity transition activities as you row back to the dock. The heart rate should gradually decrease and the rowing stroke should be less intense than during the main part of the practice. Safe Havens A coach, cox or bow person should always be aware of and looking for potential safe havens on the shoreline. Look for places where a sculler or crew could be put ashore in case of emergency. Ideally, these areas are clearly identified on the information boards at the clubhouse. In some cases, decisions must be made on the spot and an awareness of safe havens on the waterway can be very helpful. Chapter 4 Returning to Land Getting out of a crew boat Once the boat is next to the dock and the coxswain is out of the boat and on the deck, the crew should be listening for the commands to exit the boat. One foot up, ready, up. With one hand on the oar handle and the other on the dock or gunnel, the crew swings their dock side leg over the gunnel to place their foot onto the dock. Then on, ready, out. They stand on the water side leg and transferring their weight to the dock side leg, they slide or step out of the boat onto the dock. Now on the dock, the water side rowers pull their blades across the boat up to the oar locks and place the handles on the dock. After stretching and the congratulatory high fives for a fabulous workout, the water side rowers will remove their oars, placing them neatly on the middle of the dock. Getting the boat out of the water. To begin the procedure for taking the boat off the water and back into the boathouse, the bow or coxswain will call the crew to get their hands on the boat. Standing opposite their seat with their toes at the edge of the dock, they await the command hand holds or inside grips. The crew grabs handholds inside the boat or the gunnels. On take the weight, ready up, and over the heads. The crew in unison will take the weight of the boat, using their legs, not their backs. They will lift it straight up off the water, clearing the edge of the dock, walking the boat away from the edge of the dock. They roll the boat upside down directly over their heads. The coxswain or bow will call split from the bow. The crew will split alternately from the bow to go out opposite their rigger, holding the boat waiting for the command, shoulder height, ready down. On the command, walk it up, the crew will walk the boat off the dock, onto the ramp, watching for hazards such as oars, shoes, and other rowing paraphernalia along the way. Getting out of a single. After coming to a full stop and a quick recovery beside the dock, the scholar undoes his feet from the shoes. He places his waterside foot up on a cross brace in front of a seat. Then pulling himself forward by holding onto both oar handles in one hand and the other on the gunnel or deck, the scholar swings his dockside leg out onto the dock, placing his foot on the deck. Then transferring his weight to the foot on the deck, he stands up or slides out of the boat onto the dock. Once out of the boat, he pulls the waterside blade up to the oar lock and places the shaft across the boat with the handle on the dock. He will undo his oar locks, the waterside first, remove the skulls and place them parallel on the middle of the dock. Taking the single off the water. There are a number of methods of getting a single off the water. The safest way is to get assistance from another person. One person takes a position at the bow and the other at the stern compartment, each person between their end of the boat and the cockpit gunnels. With their feet on the edge of the dock, they squat down, 
lowering their seats below their knees and take hold of the shell by placing one hand under the hull. They're in a good position, ready to lift the weight of the boat off the water. On the command, they simultaneously lift the boat off the water. Using their legs, they lift the boat past their waist as they roll the boat inward towards themselves and rest the weight of the boat upside down on their shoulders. Once this move is completed, they'll walk the boat up the ramp onto stretchers on the tarmac or take it directly into the boathouse to wipe it down. Returning the shell and oars to the boathouse. Returning the boat and oars to the boathouse is in effect the mirror opposite of when they were brought down to the dock. Before taking the shell into the boathouse and placing it on the racks, the crew will place the boat upside down on stretchers, checking the boat for damage and wiping it off before putting it away. The crew will bring the oars up from the dock to the boathouse, making sure to carry them safely, mindful of either end of the oars, so they don't hit anyone or anything. Taking the boat back inside the boathouse, you should be careful not to hit riggers when placing the boat on the boat racks. The training session has ended. Good work, crew. Safety starts before you go on the water. Many accidents take place because uninformed or ill-considered decisions are made before leaving the boathouse. Weather and water conditions, time of day, the equipment, and appropriate supervision are all critical components. They must be assessed in order to ensure that it's a safe training session. Each club, in concert with the Provincial Rowing Association, is responsible for implementing and enforcing their own safety standards, taking into account their respective provincial laws and local regulations. RCA encourages all rowing clubs and individual coaches and rowers to implement and practice the foregoing guidelines to minimize the risks and maximize the enjoyment of our sport.